Music Mission of Canada is delighted to partner with the Jaipur Literature Festival. There's an exciting lineup of conversations with authors and artists from around the world. Several Canadian participants will be discussing themes such as gender equality and women's empowerment. Canada remains committed to advancing these shared values with our partners and allies from around the world. And this festival is an important forum for cultural diplomacy, allowing countries to better understand and learn from each other. I'd like to extend my best wishes to all participants, whether you're attending virtually or in person. Happy festival. We are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol, Banega Swast India. The session is presented by the High Commission of Canada. It is our pleasure to present today, Voice of Rebellion, how Mozda Jamalzada brought hope to Afghanistan. Mozda Jamalzada in conversation with Jyoti Malhotra, Afghan Canadian singer, media personality, and women's rights activist, Mozda Jamalzada is among the most powerful voices of her generation. Having realized the power of music in conveying political messages, she started singing to remind the Afghan people that women are a very big part. They've always been a big part of society. Voice of Rebellion, How Mozda Jamalzada Brought Hope to Afghanistan by Roberta Staley is the first ever biography of the formidable singer and champion of women's rights. Though threatened for her work, she continues to protest, speaking boldly on the issue of women, pertinent subjects and taboos. Her words resonate deeply with Afghan women and families. Moza Jamalzada discusses the voice of rebellion with the journalist Jyoti Malhotra. Moza Jamalzada has been called the opera of Afghanistan for having had a talk show debating taboo subjects like child marriage, violence against women and divorce in post-Taliban Afghanistan. Jamalzada has guested on the Oprah Winfrey show and performed at the White House for the Obamas on International Women's Day. Her biography, The Voice of Rebellion, written by Roberta Staley, was released in October 2019. She recently made her acting debut in the movie Red Snow, written and directed by award-winning Canadian director Mary Clements. Jyoti Malhotra has been a journalist for more than 35 years and currently works as a consulting editor with The Print, where she writes a column on India's foreign policy and anchors two video shows on Indian politics and foreign affairs. Previously, Malhotra has worked with several media in a variety of languages, both in India and abroad, including the Indian Express, the Times of India and the BBC. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A, so please feel free to send in your questions or comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, Voice of Rebellion, how Mozda Jamalzada brought hope to Afghanistan. Mozda Jamalzada in conversation with Jyoti Malhotra. Thank you all. I'm in conversation with Mozda Jamalzada, who's in Vancouver in Canada. I'm in New Delhi. We're uh, in a virtual session, not physically present at the Jaipur Literature Festival. But let me introduce you all or reintroduce you. Mozda Jamalzada is the author of a book called Voice of Rebellion and how Mozda Jamalzada brought hope to the people of Afghanistan. But more than the book, I think Mozda is, uh, is also a very well-known singer. Uh, she is or was the host of a show called The Mozda Show uh, in the years when Afghanistan, her beloved, her beloved country, um, was free of the Taliban. We know that six months or so ago, the Taliban walked back into Kabul without firing a shot. So in Mozda's life and in all our lives, for the second time again, uh, perhaps she and several thousand Afghans like her are refugees outside their own country. We will talk about all of that. But just one more thing I'd like to say before I welcome Mozda is that um, Mozda is often known as the opera Winfrey of Afghanistan, but I'd like to turn this around and say that I think perhaps opera Winfrey should be known as the Mozda Jamalzade of America. But we are in International Women's Day and I think Mozda's voice, like operas, will resound loud and clear. These are voices of women 
who will never hesitate to speak up, never be silenced uh, in, in every aspect of their lives. So Mazda, welcome to the Jaipur Literature Festival. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Thank you so much to the uh, Jaipur Literature Festival. It's an absolute honor to be here. Albeit virtually, I'm still very, very pleased to be here. I wish I was there in India with you all because it is one of my favorite countries in the world, but um, maybe hopefully uh, another time. And thank you so much for all the kind things that you just said. So Mosa, let me start by asking you about your fight for the right to speak up. Uh, especially by women. And, you know, today is International Women's Day. This is when the recording is taking place. Um, and your, your show back in Afghanistan, the Mazda show, which was, which became, I think, one of the greatest hits of all times on Afghan TV. And what is the, uh, what is the one thing that you take away from the memory of that show? Uh, the Mushda show at One TV was really the best experience of my life. But at the same time, uh, living in Afghanistan for three years and running that show, um, I was a very naive young girl who wanted to make a difference in the world, particularly in Afghanistan when it came to women's rights, seeing as how there was so much oppression uh, with the, ta the first time the Taliban were in uh, power. And then um, there was a lot of uh, influence you know there was still a lot of Taliban uh, influence after the fall of the Taliban and it was my mission to empower the women of Afghanistan the girls of Afghanistan and that's you know being that naive and being that hopeful I think the universe just provided me with all of those with everything that I needed to accomplish that and it was unbelievable how everything uh, came together and so in my mind, I gave myself five years. Uh, and within those five years, I wanted to have uh, my own show um, and like a talk show. So I started as a singer. And after that, I just wanted to, you know, have more time to speak up on women's issues. And I was given this chance within less than a year of when I made myself this promise. And so it was just the most amazing experience. But at the same time, three years living in that environment, I also became very jaded. So, you know, it was, it was very, very tough at the same time. I just want to go back to a little bit to your time in Afghanistan. And I noticed just a day or so ago that One TV, the channel that mm -hmm. you started with, the TV channel that you started with, has just shown pictures of Sirajuddin Haqqani, the uh, the terrorist um, leader who runs the Haqqani network, the terror group. Uh, he is the yes. era minister of Afghanistan. So what is interesting is that One TV is, is, you know, sending these pictures all over the world and reminding us that the, that the that voices of courage still exist in the country that you went back to. So I want you to talk a little bit about the hope that you gave the people of, your, of Afghanistan and, and how, what is it that they said to you, you know, a story perhaps that, that you remember from your time? Well, I think the media is a very, very powerful uh, tool to um, empower people and empower women. And I think that it's played a huge role and the empowerment of women uh, in Afghanistan, as we see today, when women are standing uh, in front of the Taliban while the Taliban hold guns to their heads. I think that is the bravest thing that I've ever seen. It gives me goosebumps. It makes me very emotional that these women have the courage, unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, there's an image of a, a woman holding a bottle of water and she is face-to-face uh, -face with the Taliban uh, member or soldier who has an AK-47 to her head and she has her shades on and she seems unfazed and it's it just you know it's unbelievable but it's also um, it, it's truly amazing and remarkable and I think the media uh, enabled these women it, it's not like the first time that the Taliban uh, took over and ruled Afghanistan these are educated women these are women who have you know, seeing what's on the media, how the, the Western world, the rest of uh, the world um, 
is living and they expect the same thing now and they have demands. And so when I was at One TV, I do want to thank One TV. I want to thank the the team at One TV, the the production manager who allowed me to, or the the chairman or the CEO of One TV, who allowed us to present them with this Oprah style uh, uh, concept, you know, possibility, and the fact that they were so eager to do that because I actually went there um, under the contract of uh, hosting. Afghanistan's Got Talent, and they had the licensing for this, and they were ready to go. But when my mother presented them with an Oprah-style concept show, they completely removed Afghanistan's Got Talent, and they said, this is what Afghanistan needs. And so I, ha- I appreciate the media in Afghanistan for doing their part in empowering these women and allowing me to speak on taboo subjects uh, like domestic violence, like child abuse, um, like you know, the relationship between husband and wife and how it affects uh, the family and how that overall affects society. And I remember one lady, uh, actually, there were quite a few women uh, that came up to me and said, please don't stop what you're doing. And I remember uh, one of them, the the entire family had driven from mazar Sharif, and she came and held me in a really tight hug for a very long time. And she said, because of you, my husband doesn't hit her children anymore. And she was crying and holding me. And she said, please don't stop doing what you're doing. So when I stopped the show, I felt like I had um, failed a lot of these women. And it was really hard on me. Yeah, you refer to this incident when this woman called Atifa from Azari e Sharif comes to your show and, and both of you hug each other. And it reminds mm-hmm. me of this line that you quote from Oprah Winfrey, your, your mentor, as it were, you know, your, uh, your hero in so many ways, in which she says, listen to your instincts. And you're quoting uh, this line from Oprah Winfrey in your book, in which she says, listen to your instincts. We're all beacons of light for each other. Yes. So uh, that, yes, go on. No, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it, Oprah has been a huge influence on my life. And I could tell you that my life could have been a lot different if it had not been for me religiously watching her show since I was 16 years old and the wisdom that I got from her show. And I believe that millions of people around the world, you know, uh, could possibly say the same thing, but I'm speaking for myself here. Uh, you know, there was a, a relationship that was really, really toxic that she got me out of. So. <laughs> I could have gone a whole different way. She um, empowered me to speak my mind. And of course, I, I have to say that my, my own mother and father had a lot to do with that from, from when I was very young. And so I was raised in a way where I didn't know the difference between uh, woman and man, female and male and girl and boy. I always was treated equally to my, my brothers. And I was raised... Uh, pretty much the same, if, if not more, actually, I could possibly say, because I was the oldest, I was given a lot more responsibility and a lot more um, uh, power. <laughs> and so, you know, I was the one that was asking my brothers where they were going and what time they would be home and, you know, playing a little bit of that uh, parental role when my parents were not around and, you know, giving me that responsibility of taking care of my brothers. Uh, so, between my my father being a feminist and me being um, or, or being raised in, in that environment with his influence and of course my mother as well, uh, and then there's Oprah, uh, you know that I, I think yeah that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> but Masa, you know uh, this. T- tell me, talk to me a little bit about this environment in which you grew up. This these feminists in, around you, including your father, like you just said, and I want to draw you to. Uh, to the question of religion, of Islam in your life. And more than once in your book, in uh, The Voice of Rebellion, you talk about how, you know, you're told, especially when the country, when Afghanistan falls to the Taliban, uh, and uh, you hear over television, of course, you're sitting in your home in Vancouver, but you hear over CNN and, and other media that the Taliban insist that the voice of God is the most important thing and that you must never question it. And then you say, mm-hmm. well, if being, and that's what being a good Muslim is, is by not questioning the voice of God. And then you say in the book that if being a good Muslim is 
means that you cannot question things and perhaps she could never be a good Muslim uh, to a lot of people. Uh, yes, actually, my when I was in Afghanistan, I was five years old and I was in first grade. They moved me up from kindergarten. And um, I remember I was when when the teacher was uh, explaining uh, the Quran and Islam, uh, I had some questions and she said, you shouldn't question the religion. If you question it, you're a kafir. And at that moment, I said, well, what, why did God give me a brain if they, he didn't want me to question anything? Because I can't help but question what you're asking of me, um, you know, to be uh, a good servant of God or to be um, to obey or to worship. I said, my God would not ask me to worship or fear um, that entity. Like, the, I, I think that it would be, you know, it, it almost cruel to force somebody to do certain things um and also the fact that i mean this i was five years old and all these things were going through my mind and i realized that the rest of the children were quiet and whether it was going through their minds or not they had accepted it and i refused to accept that so at that point i was like well i guess i guess it's not god's intention for me to be a good muslim then if you know, if i'm going to be questioning i can't i can't help it i can't stop it so i think that um questioning everything in the world is a gift to be able to, you know, think freely. And um, I, I think that's a gift that, that the universe or God has given and, and I will not take it for granted and I, I won't allow um, society or anybody to implement their ways on, on my life and the way that I want to live. But you, this determination that comes through, which is to question things again and again, you know, your teacher, for example, when you were so young in Vancouver, later when the Taliban takes power uh, for the first time, again, you're questioning things. And yeah, when you go to Afghanistan and become, a, uh, you know, the host or the anchor of the of the TV show, the Mazda show, and you're, and one of your colleagues sort of tries to assault you. And that violence is something that, uh, that you question again and again. So this, this determination that you have inside of you, what is it that, that, you, um, that you want to say to other women who, who may be in this, you know, sort of difficult circumstances, whether it's back in Afghanistan or elsewhere in the world? Well, at that point, uh, that was a very pivotal moment in my life because it, it's very difficult to go through something like that. And until you go through something like that, you wouldn't understand how difficult it is. But at that moment, I had to decide, did I want it to overpower me? And you're talking about the assault. What, you're talking about the assault yes. that your colleague tried to commit. At that moment, I decided that I could either allow this person to, um, or what he did, uh, overpower my life and and take over my life or I could move it aside no matter how difficult it is and continue and keep going and I think that a strong person I, I can't say you know I, everybody's different but at that moment I knew that I couldn't let him win and I could not allow that to stop me from doing what I'm doing and I just it was it was tough but I had to get over it and continue and move forward so just to tell my viewers at this point uh, Mazda is subjected to an assault by a, uh, a sexual assault by one of her former colleagues a powerful man in the uh, tv company that she works and how she fights back and uh, refuses then you know, is in deep depression for some time, but refuses to allow this to take over her life. But the question I have for you, Mazda, is that this account of this assault is very graphically written in the book. Now, you know, for Asian women like us to talk about experiences like this also means that you're confronting um, sort of some horrible emotions. And there's a lot of shame attached to that. So why would you why, how, come, how is it that you were so, e that you were able to write about this? Um, 
I made that decision because I am not ashamed. I didn't do anything wrong. And um, that was completely the actions of someone who you know, wanted to hurt me. And I'm not going to allow that to shame me in any way. And I wanted to tell my story because, again, like you said, uh, Asian women tend to not reveal those things. And I knew a lot of girls and women in Afghanistan working in the TV stations and working in basically just being in the workforce, dealing with those things, but keeping it quiet. And they had no choice. I know that in Afghanistan or in countries like that, it's very difficult for people to speak up. But um, fortunately, I do live in the West and I was able to tell my story. But if I was in Afghanistan, it would have been different. You know, just to um, uh, just to press home a little bit on this, a lot of people would say that if you talk about this assault on you, and it's very graphically written, you know, your your pearl string is broken, the the pearls are sort of underfoot, and how your your blouse is is uh, is pulled, your your body, your your uh, your la- your arms are sort of uh, bruised, black and blue. Now, some mm-hmm. would say she's not a good woman. Well, yes, because um, in in some people's minds or views, uh, you know, depending on their ideologies, I could be not a good woman for singing, being on television, or in some people's minds in Afghanistan, just as I have come across these people, they think of me as not a good woman because I'm in the workforce, because I don't stay home and have children and cook for my family. Instead, I'm out and you know, being participating or being a part of society, um, that I, I work alongside men that, um, oh, especially, I know that, you know, a lot of uh, men mostly think that I'm not a good woman because I am on stage singing and dancing and that if something like that happens to me, I'm asking for it. And that is a man's world and that is uh, a patriarchal society that we live in, especially certain regions uh, where it's highlighted a lot more. But you refuse to allow yourself to be defined by that? Oh, yes, absolutely. I will never allow anybody to define me, especially those men with those ideologies. (laughs) So how were you able to overcome that and how were you able to tell your story in this book, a story that I'm sure empowers a lot of other women too? My main goal in life, Jyoti, is to empower women. I have been very fortunate to have grown up with so much strength. And like I said, my own father is a feminist. He believes that there should be no such thing as women's issues living in the 21st century. And I agree with him. So having a father like that and being, you know, and then having a mother that is so strong, probably one of the strongest women... I could say, you know, she she could possibly be stronger than Oprah. <laughs> I've never met a woman as strong and as as hardworking and um, self efficient as my mother. Um, and so, growing up in that environment empowered me a lot. And not every girl has that opportunity or that chance or that environment to grow up in. And that's where I want to come in. That's where I want to. You know, everything that I've been taught, I feel like what I have, the strength that I have is like a superpower. And when I see women questioning themselves, you know, at at the workplace or at home or allowing men to treat them a certain way, it breaks my heart. And I just, I get so angry. And I've been like that since I was young. And I, like I said, I question everything. And I stand up for myself, I stand up for my peers, I stand up for anyone who is under attack in any situation. Uh, I believe strongly in human rights, especially women's rights, children's rights. Uh, They're mostly the victims, you know, when it comes to war in a lot of situations in a lot of regions. Um, So my, my goal in life, and that's the reason why I had the talk show, that's the reason why I started singing, because I don't, I'm not really a fan of music. Believe it or not, I'm a singer, but I'm not a fan of music. And a lot of people don't know that. And um, I just, my my main thing was to use that 
to use my platform to empower women. And I have a long way to go. I haven't even started yet. So whether, so whether people believe you're a good woman or not, you're going to keep fighting and you're going to keep that voice of rebellion um, and, the, and that fire of, re- of rebellion um, in your life. Absolutely. And you know what? To me, I'm a good person. <laughs> so whether I'm a good woman or a bad woman in some people's eyes and whether I'm supposed to be, you know, according to society or certain uh, societies, be a certain uh, way as a woman, um, you know, uh, do certain womanly things. Um, that aside, I am a good human being. I mean well, and I have a good heart. And uh, I love and respect all living things, the, the entire planet. And to, so to myself and my family, I'm a good person. That's all that counts to me. And I, I want other women to feel the same way. Absolutely, uh, Mosda. I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm going to, at this point, <laughs> recite two lines from one of the songs that your, or, or a poem that your father Bashir wrote. It's called Dukh Tere Afghan, which in English is The Afghan Girl. And, uh, you know, two lines of, from here is, don't break my wings, let me fly. Don't break my crown, let me think. And I think that sort of encapsulates the spirit um, behind your life, or, and at least what we've seen so far and the book in, uh, that you, in which you write about. But tell me a little bit about, you know, there's an incident in your book, which is um, about this woman called Zarmina who is shot by the Taliban. They pump several bullets into her head, all because she's accused of burning the Holy Quran. It transpires that that she never did anything of the sort. But tell me what that did to you, that story. Um, I, I could tell you that I cried for a month continuously. I think that was the first heartbreak I ever felt that uh, Farhunda, this young girl who had a bright future, who was educated, you know, her, her, she met her end in, in the most, probably the worst, most terrifying way any human could. And all because she called out a religious priest on doing something wrong. And because it's a man's world, especially that region, especially when it comes to religion, his word against hers was everything and that's what resulted in in her horrible death and or murder and by by regular street people imagine just not street people but people just regular people walking on the street um heard him say that she burned the quran and this is what they did so it wasn't it wasn't criminals it wasn't people who who had you know murdered before it wasn't the taliban these were regular young afghan men walking on the streets of kabul heading home from school or whatever they were doing from work or going to work and i couldn't believe the anger that just the regular public the male regular public felt for women and I don't know where it stems from. I don't know where it comes from. But why so much anger towards a, another human being? Uh, because of the, you know, in the name of religion, murdering someone like that in the most horrific way in the name of religion just makes me sick. Mm-hmm. But this, you know, you grapple with this a lot with the fact of being labeled a kafir. And when you, uh, when you write, when you talk about Parkunda Malikzada, the uh, this woman in question who was accused of uh, burning the Quran, and and there are you know the trolls get after you, and uh, yes. and you know and you and one one guy says, well why can't you get over this woman bullshit? But that's something mm-hmm. that angers you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And but but I like that anger because it fuels me to do more. Because if that anger wasn't there. If, if the oppression didn't exist, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I just, I mean, I wish that's the case. I, I wish that was the case because, you know, I could live my life and, and just uh, spend time with my family and friends and not think about trying to empower women because they would already be empowered and, or, or, 
you know, I know that there are a lot of women who are, but like I said, there are a lot who are in situations where they can't be. And um, so I wish the circumstances were different, but having people like that and these trolls, they fuel the fire and it makes me want to do this more. And every time things calm down, I get something like this. It angers me and I'm back at it. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about uh, the burqa. Now, the, the cover of the book in which you're covered in the blue burqa, the, uh, the mm. chapel. Uh, right now, of course, you're wearing, you know, you're wearing sort of a shirt and like Western dress. But the, the book is very evocative because when your mother, your family, when they flee Afghanistan in 1989, you were five years old, of course, of course at the time, but she covers herself in this traditional uh, blue burqa. And the cover of your book also has the same picture. So what does that mean to you? Is it, is it a symbol of hope like it was to your Should mother? I show it? <laughs> yes, of course. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. That is, that is my mother's burqa right there. And that was taken on the set of the movie Red Snow. Uh, and then the publishers and myself, we wanted this for the cover of this book because this book is very important to me. And um, the, the photo was taken by um, Howard. And I, it was just, it was an amazing moment where I, I think it was just... Um, it was one of those moments where I, I didn't really know what was happening and I just turned around and he snapped a photo. So uh, it was a very candid photo and very candid moment. And um, yeah. But, but you know, you talk about women's liberation, freedom of oppression, and then you wear a burqa on the cover of, your, of this book. So is, isn't that a contradiction in terms? I mean, what not the burqa um, a symbol, if you like, of oppression? Well, the reason that I had this, um, the reason that I chose this and, and the publishing company chose this is because, uh, like I said, it was my mother's burqa. And this is what helped us escape Afghanistan, <laughs> believe it or not. And tw I think maybe possibly 26 years later or 30 years later, however long uh, later it was, I'm on this, you know, we're about to shoot this uh, movie. Um, Red Snow and Marie Clements, the director, says, well, we got, you know, our wardrobe team has everything, uh, but the only thing we can't find is a burqa. And so my mom, and every time I have an issue, I go to my mom, she solves any problem I have. And she's like, oh, well, I have, I have my burqa. I said, what do you mean? She's like, when we escaped, I still have it. And it was a secondhand burqa because we had to pretend we were from a small village just, you know, pretending to go back to the small village. So it was a secondhand burqa and it's got holes in it. and It's very old looking. And um, she said that she had wrapped it neatly for 20 plus years um, and that, you know, she gave it to me. And so I'm, I'm wearing it on the set of uh, this movie. And it was in Cam filmed in Kamloops. It's very dry and hot there. It was 36 degrees Celsius. And... I had to wear this burqa for the scene. And of course, you know, it's an all day thing. And the moment that I put it over my head, as I was filming this scene, I started hyperventilating and I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. And all of a sudden my ear, my, my eyes got uh, very teary and I didn't know what was happening to me. It's, it's like, um, you know, a million emotions just jump at me at once. And I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if I'm okay. And, um, uh, Marie had to call cut and lift, you know, they had to lift it over my head. And at that moment I was hyperventilating. They were giving me water. My, my tears were just dripping. And I, I'm like, am I crying? Am I, what's happening right now? And I realized for the first time that this is what the women of Afghanistan are going through every single day. In my situation, Marie called cut. And I lifted the veil and I was fine, you know, and I realized at that moment in that 36 degree heat, and this is, this is the life, the life of every woman in Afghanistan, especially during the Taliban, 15 hours a day or however many hours a day they're out and about, you know, running errands in something like that. And that just, it really took a toll on me. So um, it represents a lot for me 
Uh, and if you ask my mother, this was interesting because I, the first thing I said to my mom was, why didn't you burn the burqa? The first thing I would have done was, you know, after I found my freedom, I would have burned it. And she goes, that was our freedom. And she's like, it, it's ironic that the, the si signal, I mean, the symbol of oppression was actually what got us free and, and helped us escape Afghanistan. So it, it's just a different perspective. You know, you're, you're just looking at different perspectives. And like I said, it means a lot to me and, and it has so many different um, meanings for me now. So, so very interesting thing. That was so beautifully uh, spoken, Majda. But before we end, I, I was wondering if you could sing us a couple of lines, perhaps uh, from the song, which is the um, either from Dukhtari Afghan, which is the uh, the tribute to the Afghan girl, or perhaps even to Farkunda Malikzada, if you could sing us a couple of lines. Well, yeah, I can definitely do that. Um... I just need to get a second. <laughs> Go from talking mode to singing mode. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Dochtara, Dochtare Afghan Amma, Dochtare Mulke del Iran Amma, Mashikan Polo Paramra, Mashikan, Mashikan Tajasaram Bra, Mashikan. As the moza that you all who badama, as the moza that you all who badama, Ishkaram to Malala Ibawata, Sadi Hamna Machu Bulbul Bachama, Zainabo knows O Mary Pasoha, Zainabo knows O Mary Pasoha. Okay. That was so beautiful. The longing in your voice, I think, Thank you. uh, came across this virtual screen all the way from Vancouver. Thank you so much for your time. We wish you could have Thank been here you so much. in Jaipur. But, uh, I know, I wish too. <laughs> this is only a, a poor second best, but thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure, Jyoti. Thank you. Thank you, Moza Jamal Zada and Jyoti Malhotra for this wonderful conversation. This session was presented by the High Commission of Canada. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you.